Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> um, today we're going to be reading Leviticus 16, verses 1 to 22 and 29 to 34. It's quite a chunky passage, so please stay with it. Um, if you don't have a Bible yet, but you want one, please pop your hands up. The stewards will give you one. Um, on the, in the church Bibles, the page is 118. So that's Leviticus 16. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron who died when they approached the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron that he is not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place behind the curtain in front of the atonement cover on the ark or else he will die for I will appear in the cloud over the atonement cover. This is how Aaron is to enter the most holy place. He must first bring a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He is to put on the sacred linen tunic with linen undergarments next to his body. He is to tie the linen sash around him and put on the linen turban. These are sacred garments, so he must bathe himself with water before he puts them on. From the Israelite community, he is to take two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Aaron is to offer the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household. He is to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls on to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by Lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household, and he is to slaughter the bull for his own sin offering. He is to take a censer full of burning coals from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of ground of finely ground fragrant incense and take them behind the curtain. He is to put the incense on the fire before the Lord and the smoke of the incense will conceal the atonement cover above the tablets of the covenant law so that he will not die. He is to take some of the bull's blood with his fingertips, sprinkle it on the front of the atonement cover. Then he shall sprinkle some of it with his fingers seven times before the atonement cover. He shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people and take the blood behind the curtain and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of it. In this way, he will make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites, whatever their sins have been. He is to do the same for the tent of meeting, which is among them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one is to be in the tent of meeting from the time Aaron goes in to make atonement in the most holy place until he comes out, having made atonement for himself, his household, and the whole community of Israel. Then he shall come out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. He shall take some of the bull's blood and some of the goat's blood and put it on the horns of the altar. He shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times to cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the Israelites. When Aaron has finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess it and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the wilderness, into the care of someone appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all the sins to a remote place, and the man shall release it in the wilderness. The second part of the passage is verse 29 to 34. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you. On the tenth day of the seventh month, you must deny yourselves and not do any work whether native-born or a foreigner residing among you, because on this day atonement was made for you to cleanse you. Then before the Lord you will be clean from all your sins. 
It is a day of Sabbath rest, and you must deny yourselves. It is a lasting ordinance. The priest who is anointed and ordained to succeed his father as high priest is to make atonement. He is to put on the sacred linen garments and make atonement for the most holy place, for the tent of meeting and the altar, and for the priests and all the members of the community. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you. Atonement is to be made once a year for all the sins of the Israelites. And it was done as the Lord commanded Moses. I'm just going to pray for John as he comes up. Um, Lord, thank you that we live in a country where we can be free to practice our faith, Lord. Um, help us to be bold in this, Lord. And I pray that as uh, John comes up to um, expound your word, Father, I pray you'll give us hearts to receive it, that you'll unstop our ears and remove any scales off our eyes, Lord. Help us to be soft in our heart, Lord, to any convictions you might be trying to give us, Lord, and just bless the words of John um, as he reads your word today. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to all those of you who haven't gone out to explore together. I wonder whether perhaps after hearing that very long and complicated reading, some of you may be thinking, hmm, perhaps I should have gone out there after all. Um, so if that's you, if you found that reading, perhaps, you know, your, your head is spinning a little after that very long reading. I'm going to suggest before we start, we just all stand up for about 30 seconds and just sort of have a shake around and... Okay, that'll do, that'll do. <laughs> Please sit down again. <clears throat> so this morning we're continuing our, our mini-series entitled Echoes of Easter, where we're looking at some of the Old Testament uh, passages and prophecies which look forward to and in a sense foreshadow the coming of the Lord Jesus and his sacrificial death for us. Remember last week we looked at the Passover and remembered the time when the Lord rescued his people from slavery in Egypt and he saved them from his judgment, the death of the firstborn in the land of Egypt, by the blood of lambs sacrificed on their behalf as God had commanded them. And from that time on the Passover was remembered annually as the time of new beginning for God's people. Well, today we're looking at another hugely significant annual festival that God gave his people in the period following their exodus in the wilderness. And here in Leviticus 16, we read about the Day of Atonement. Now, hopefully you picked up as we read those verses that this was an occasion of high drama as much as it was of great significance. In fact, it became the high point of Israel's year. The whole community was instructed to practice self-denial on this particular day, and they celebrated it on the 10th day of the seventh month, which was the most sacred of months in the Jewish calendar. It was so important that much later on, the rabbis came to refer to it simply as the day. The day. Well, it's often said that a picture paints a thousand words, and in this particular part of the Old Testament, we see God giving his people a number of highly visual and also very dramatic representations of spiritual realities. And so this tent of meeting, or tabernacle as it's called sometimes, together with its rituals and regular sacrifices, was like a huge visual aid that help them understand what God is like and also understand how they were to relate to him. It was as though God was giving them a kind of visual theology, if you like, something tangible that could be remembered and experienced throughout the whole community. But I guess however fascinating we may have found the details, uh, perhaps strange sounding details to us in that reading, we may well be asking ourselves what relevance this very ancient ritual can possibly have for us today as 21st century Christians. You know, I guess if we were to take a straw poll this morning and ask what are our favorite Bible books, I'm not gonna do that by the way, but if we were to do that, my guess would be that not many hands would go up for the book of Leviticus, is that fair? Yeah, I'm getting quite a few nods, so I think that's probably fair. 
So you might be asking, why then bother to wade through such a complicated and difficult passage like this one when we could simply be turning in our Bibles to our favourite New Testament passages that tell us about Jesus and his death for us? Good question. Well, one reason I think it's worth persevering, so please, please stay with us this morning, is that this, this chapter does refer very clearly to what we read in the New Testament. In fact, when we do turn to the New Testament, we discover that the language of Leviticus, especially its focus on things like sacrifice and atonement, that language is taken up and used by the New Testament writers. And they apply those same terms to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and its significance for us today. And so it's as though these sacrificial offerings and ceremonies detailed in Leviticus are a kind of sketch, a kind of preliminary outline drawing, as it were, by God, which looks forward to his great masterpiece that was to be unveiled in the coming and in the death of our Lord Jesus. Just an example, we find the writer to the Hebrews in the New Testament using much of the imagery of the Day of Atonement to explain Jesus' permanent priesthood and his perfect once-for-all sacrifice on our behalf. So rather than skipping over chapters like this one and sort of fast-forwarding immediately to the New Testament, it's helpful for us to just pause and ask first what this Day of Atonement was designed to teach its original audience in their original context. Because, of course, unlike us, they didn't have the advantage of knowing how these events were eventually going to be fulfilled. So, we're in the time of God giving the old covenant to the people of Israel through Moses. And uh, we read in Exodus 19, verse 5, that God said this, If you obey me fully and keep my covenant then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. See, God valued his people beyond measure. He loved them intensely. And yet, he needed to teach them how they might approach him and how they might enjoy fellowship with him. And this Day of Atonement is really a key part of his provision for them. Now, you'll be relieved to hear that as this chapter is such a long and complicated one, I'm only going to attempt a very, very brief, broad brush summary of some of the key points for us today. And that means I'm inevitably going to be missing out lots of detail on the way. So, may I encourage you, if you do have time, to explore this chapter in more detail on your own during the week. Do take time to do that, because there's so much here. But without further ado, let's dive into this chapter. And the first thing I think that strikes us as we read through this, these verses is the intense focus here on God's holiness and God's purity. In verses 1 and 2, God begins with a solemn warning to Aaron, the high priest, Aaron is not to enter this most holy place within the tabernacle, within this tent of meeting, at any old time he chooses. And in fact, God reminds him of a disastrous event, which is recorded back in Leviticus chapter 10, when two of Aaron's sons had offered what is called unauthorised fire before the Lord, contrary to God's command. And we read there that because of their disobedience, fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Aaron, therefore, is in danger of death himself should he attempt to enter this most holy place in an unauthorised or careless manner. Now, as many of you, I'm sure, will know, this most holy place was the inner room within the tent of meeting, where God's presence and God's glory was particularly manifested. It was the room which contains the Ark of the Covenants, the chest which contained the Ten Commandments God had given, and which had an atonement cover on top of it. 
and a thick curtain separated this most holy place from all the other areas within the tent of meeting. And it was strictly out of bounds for the high priest, except on this annual day of atonement. But even then, it was only safe for him to enter if he obeyed to the letter God's requirements for personal cleansing, the wearing of special sacred garments, and an animal sacrifice to atone for his own sins, as we read in verses 3 to 6, if you're following in your Bibles, and also verse 11. You see, as a sinful person himself, Aaron, as high priest, must first offer a sacrifice of atonement for his own sins before entering God's presence and offering sacrifices on behalf of the community. And we read he must also take a censer, a, a censer full of burning coals and some fragrant incense with him as he enters behind the curtain to sprinkle blood on and before the atonement cover, verses 12 to 14. And it's as though the fire and incense form a kind of smoke screen, a kind of protective barrier hiding God from Aaron. Because, of course, to look upon God's face wouldn't be bearable for a sinful person. Now, the curtain then separating the most holy place from the rest of the tent of meeting served as a kind of protective barrier for the priests. And years later, a similar curtain separated the most holy place within the Jerusalem temple. And so when we do move into the New Testament, we find the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, each record that that curtain of separation was torn in two from top to bottom at the very moment when Jesus died on the cross. So here then is the first key message which is illuminated and, and visualised by the physical layout of the tent of meeting and also these extensive preparations that the priest had to go through. God is absolutely holy. He's perfect in every aspect of his being and he's therefore separate from his imperfect people. He's set apart from them even while dwelling in their midst. His holiness can't be compromised or breached in any way by the presence of anything which is unclean or unholy. Although God lives with them and grants his many blessings to them, there are strict limits on their ability either to see God, God's face or to enter his presence. God is holy and they are not. Now, in case we're tempted to think that God has changed in some way since these Old Testament times, the New Testament tells us very plainly that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His character never changes in any way. He is forever perfectly holy, and we must therefore approach him still with reverence and with awe. In the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, we read this. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful, as we were thinking this morning, and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Note, is a consuming fire, not was a consuming fire. And so God is still the Holy One, and he can never allow his holiness to be compromised by the presence of sin or uncleanness in his dwelling place. And today, as then, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. You know, God can't simply overlook our sin or turn a blind eye to it. His holiness means that we dare not minimise or trivialise the reality and the seriousness of our sin. Yes, he loves us beyond measure, but his love is a holy and a purifying love. He longs to cleanse us, and he commands us to take hold of the sacrifice of atonement that he has provided for us. Only then, only then are we safe from the penalty of death, and only then can we be welcomed into his presence. 
But now let's leave those initial preparations for a moment and move on to what is really the main focus of the day, where the high priest is told to take two goats and present them before the Lord, verses 7 and 8. And we're told that chosen by lot, one goat is said to be for the Lord, and the other is for the scapegoat. The first goat is slaughtered as a sin offering for the people, verse 15, and its blood is sprinkled on the atonement cover in the most holy place and in front of it. Verse 16 says that in this way, the priest will make atonement for the most holy place and the tent of meeting, both of which have become defiled because of the rebellion and uncleanness of the Israelites. Big statement, isn't it? Likewise, verses 18 and 19 speak of Aaron making atonement for the altar to consecrate it from the uncleanness of the Israelites. So on this very special day, the whole sanctuary is cleansed, as well as the people themselves. Every part of this tent of meeting, the place where God lives among his people, must be absolutely pure for him to dwell there. And so here's a second point, which I think this chapter highlights for us. And that is how pervasive and all-encompassing are the sins which pollute and spoil not only the individual worshippers, but also their community and the very environment in which they worship. Individual sin has led to communal pollution as well as separation from God. Everyone and every part of the sanctuary is affected by it. I think it's a powerful reminder, you know, that none of us lives to ourself alone. You know, what we may think of sometimes as secret or personal sins actually impacts on those that we live with, work with, and worship with in ways that we may not even be aware of sometimes. And our sin has even spoiled the physical environment in which we inhabit. As we think about this Old Testament sanctuary then, we're reminded of the New Testament's declaration that the church is God's temple and dwelling place today. And so in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16, we read, don't you know that you yourselves, includes us, are God's temple and that God's spirit lives among you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred. And you together are that temple. And only a few chapters later, Paul reminds the Corinthians that their bodies as individual believers are also to be regarded as temples of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, we read, You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honour God with your body. So if each of us individually and together as the body of Christ are affected by this pollution of sin and the judgment our sin deserves, we need an atonement sufficient to cover all our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And likewise, the people of Israel needed the assurance that all their sins would be covered by the atoning blood of the sacrifices that were offered on their behalf. Well then thirdly, we have this amazing and dramatic enactment in which all the sins of the community of Israel are symbolically transferred to the second of these two goats, the scapegoat, by the confession and the laying on of hands by the priest representing the people in verses 20 to 22. And then the goat, now bearing their sins, is led away beyond the camp into the desert, carrying the sins of the whole community far, far away to the most distant part of the wilderness. It's quite a picture, isn't it? Very dramatic. And without wishing to overcomplicate this part of the drama, we must just note that the NIV footnotes to verses 8 and 26 tell us that the precise meaning of the Hebrew word translated here as scapegoat is a bit uncertain. The goat is literally said to be for Azazel, or Azazel, which might simply mean the goat which is led away, 
Or the word might refer to a demonic ruler of the wilderness, a kind of desert demon. In which case, the picture here is of God sending evil back to its source, back to the place where it truly belongs, having removed it completely from Israel. Well, either way, the powerful and memorable symbolism of this action must surely have led to great celebration and also intense relief as the community watched this animal bearing their sins being led away to the furthest reaches of the wilderness. You can almost imagine them letting out a great cheer as they watched that happening. And so through the double provision of these two goats, the sentence of death their sins deserved was not only paid for by the shedding of blood, the ransom price that God himself had specified, but also those same sins were removed far from them. How great the rejoicing must have been. You know, I wonder whether David perhaps had this day in mind when he composed Psalm 103 with its celebration of the Lord's forgiveness. He says there in verses 11 and 12, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. What a wonderful truth as we think about what Jesus has done for us through his death. But the Day of Atonement wasn't quite over yet. And in the verses that we didn't read, the final act of dedication was for the priest to take off the linen garments that he'd entered the sanctuary with and then sacrifice a bull as a burnt offering for himself and for the people to make atonement for himself and them as a renewal of their dedication to the Lord, verses 23 to 25. And maybe, maybe without going this extra mile, as it were, the people of Israel might perhaps have been tempted to take for granted God's grace that was so evident in that main drama of the day. But no, they needed to remain under the protection and cleansing of the atoning sacrifices God had provided for them if they were to live in obedience and dedication to the Lord. Likewise, the man who'd released the scapegoat had to wash his clothes and bathe himself afterwards, having touched the animal bearing the people's sin and uncleanness. And finally, the hides, the flesh and intestines of the bull and the goat that had been sacrificed were taken outside the camp where they had to be burnt, verse 27. And the whole of this day was to be treated as a Sabbath. The people were to deny themselves as a sign of their consecration to the Lord. Well, that's a very, very brief and very sketchy outline of this day that was of such profound importance to the people of Israel. But I hope that as we've done this quick canter through some of its highlights, we've begun to see some of the many ways in which this day points us forward to its ultimate fulfilment in Jesus' perfect sacrifice for us. So, without much further comment from me this morning, I want to end simply by reading several verses from the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, which compares but also contrasts the finished work of the Lord Jesus with the kinds of sacrifices offered here by the Old Testament priests. We start with Hebrews 9, verses 11 and 12. We read, But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, is not part of this creation. He didn't enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, so obtaining eternal redemption and I'm going to move over to the following chapter Hebrews 10 where the writer encourages us to persevere in our faith as we remember all that Jesus has accomplished for us through his sacrificial death and he says there in Hebrews 10 19 therefore brothers and sisters 
Since we have confidence, we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, that is Jesus, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. You see where the symbolism comes from Leviticus? Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. That's what we've been doing today. We've been encouraging one another as we think and we prepare our hearts for Jesus coming again. So this morning, let us draw near to God as we come to the time of communion with reverence and awe, remembering that he is the Holy One. Well, let's also enter his presence with confidence and with joy through the atoning blood of Jesus, our perfect sacrifice. You know, Jesus said that he had come to give his life as a ransom for many. And he's not only redeemed us from the penalty of our sin, but he's also removed our sins far from us. So let us be those who deny ourselves and instead offer him a sacrifice of praise, worship, and obedience. Amen.